Hi, I'm Debbie Saunders from Wildlife Drones, and today we're going to um, share some ideas about some real-time data collection for improving wildlife management using a combination of drone and radio tracking technology. So to start with, we'll look at the radio tracking. So with radio tracking systems now that can be put onto a drone, you can track up to 40 tagged animals simultaneously instead of one at a time, which is what currently happens out in the field. The locations of all of those tagged animals are mapped in real time on a laptop, and you can able actually survey really rugged and remote landscapes a lot easier. It has a directional antenna, and so as you're flying around, you can point it down gullies, up over ridges, etc., um, all from one location where the pilot is standing. Um, you can survey really massive areas. You can also minimise the amount of disturbance that happens um, to the animals that you're trying to study, um, both to the animals themselves, because this system does not require to go, uh, need to go close to the animals. It actually is better to stay away, so you can get really nice directions and triangulate the location of the animals. You also don't need to go trampling um, through their habitat, and this can be particularly important for species that live in the understory or in grasses or what have you, and rely on that structure as their protection in their habitat. There's also other non-target species. So when we're out tracking on islands where there are burrowing um, birds that actually nest underground, then there's no need to go and trample through those habitats in order to search for another species. You can actually do it from a distance without causing that problem. A recent advance that is now possible as well is to be able to detect mortality signals. So some very high frequency radio tags actually change their pulse rate if their uh, animal has not moved within a specified period of time. Until now, it's really depended on people listening with a handheld device and determining whether it's a fast pulse rate or a slow pulse rate as to whether there is um, something going wrong with one of these animals. Now with the drone for all 40 tags, as soon as the drone is in the air and it's picking up a signal, you can actually see exactly what the pulse rate is. So if what your main concern is just the survival um, of animals in an area, they might be captive bred and released, for example, then you can very, very rapidly ascertain what the status of those animals are. We can also attach a third party GPS data download system uh, to our antenna so that if you have close proximity data downloads, such as for feral cats and the like, then you can actually attach that system to our antenna and be able to pick up those signals and download the data from further away. To give you an idea of what this actually looks like, this is what our Wildlife Drones user interface looks like. This is a screenshot. Um, the yellow line there is, is where you can download your maps, and that is the only time when you need access to the internet to get the maps. And then once you've got your maps downloaded, you're free to head out into the bush and do all your tracking. No connectivity is required. It's designed to be really simple, so uh, you work from the top of the buttons on the left there down to the bottom um, as you go to use the system. So that's what the user interface looks like. But once you start tracking, this is what you start to see on the screen. So from your first rotation, when you launch the drone and you slowly rotate it, you're picking up signals in all directions, um, from each of the directions, sorry. And as soon as you get a strong signal um, and you can get a bearing, those bearings are displayed on the map. You can choose whether you want a topographic map, which can be really handy if there's really rugged landscapes, or you can use a satellite image, either one. Once you've done your first rotation and you have those bearings pointing to where all those animals are, you can then choose where to fly the drone for the next rotation. And as I mentioned, you're triangulating, so you really want to move the drone so you're getting nice perpendicular lines where possible, and then you get your most accurate um, location estimates. As soon as you get two intersecting lines, you start to see the points on the map like you can see in the centre there. 
there's a central point which has a coordinate and then there's actually a, a margin around that to give you an idea of the confidence that, that, that it is in that specific location. The reason we do that is that some, with radio signals there's often a lot of bounce or an animal might be obscured in some way and so the signal might not be particularly strong. So we like to give you a feeling for that so you know how confident you can be. So you get those coordinates and at the bottom there that doesn't typically pop up on the screen but I wanted to show you what the actual data looks like. So um, although you see this beautiful map in the back end there's a CSV file being created and it contains all of your animals, their unique tag frequencies and the coordinates um, that have been calculated. So you can use that immediately to put it into any other software or um, analysis software, mapping software, whatever you like. So really accessible, really um, flexible tool um, that you can use and takes radio tracking to a whole new level. To give you an example um, of a project that we did uh, down in New Zealand, a demonstration project with the Department of Conservation, um, we, we took the drone uh, down to Whenuaho to track Gakupo and uh, within two hours of um, the flying the drone, we did approximately the equivalent of about four days of manual tracking. So we were tracking up to 40 tag birds or 19% of the entire population um, simultaneously and we were able to get locations um, within, from this one location that we were flying on approximately 24 birds. Um, we got bearings to other ones which were more distant um, so we could keep going and, and actually be able to focus our effort in those areas. Um, on this island it is quite rugged, uh, quite dense, very wet vegetation as well and these birds are underneath that, uh, underneath the dense canopy. Um, and there's only limited access tracks. So um, being able to go up to a high point on the island and cover you know, a third to a half of the island from one place, um, it was a real game changer for them. But also uh, we're able to increase the, the quality and the quantity of data that you're able to collect. So the, the accuracy, because we can specify exactly what the accuracy of that data is, then um, we actually can have a lot more confidence than if you're having to triangulate using volunteers um, and trying to synchronize people in different locations. So then we look at uh, drone thermal imaging. So this is where you have a thermal camera that detects infrared radiation. Um, and you can use it in a number of different ways. You can either use it in real time, um, which I think is the most common application, or you can uh, record the images and videos um, for, for uh, monitoring programs and, and actually doing repeated surveys. Typically, uh, the thermal imaging is, is used to locate cryptic nocturnal animals. You need to have that thermal signature difference between the animals you're trying to detect and its environment. So you would often be doing this at night. Um, and the nice thing is that the animals don't need to be tagged to use the sensor. And this is one of the reasons why it's really nice complementary technology to the radio tracking. You can uh, monitor populations more broadly, but you can also track animal movements more specifically. Some of the challenges with um, thermal imaging is, um, the, well, I guess, the experience to fly at night um, safely. But also, if you're flying in burnt or very wet landscapes, there's actually a lot of reflectance um, that, that gets picked up by the camera. And so that can make it particularly challenging to pick up the detail that you need to identify some animals. Um, and also dense vegetation actually will block the signals uh, or the reflectance and so it acts like a shield or an umbrella if you like. And so actually doing thermal surveys in dense vegetation is particularly challenging. Having said that, um, this, this technology can be used for both native and invasive species. And when you're out there flying, you can actually, you can get a pretty good feel for a lot of things. You've got the temperature um, signature that you're picking up and it will tell you what the temperature is. You can determine the size, the shape, and even the behavior can be quite important given it's not as high a resolution as you would have in an RGB image. The real-time data is really important um, for on-ground action. So it might be that you need to capture, uh, capture an animal to put a tag on it. You might need to do some health checks or just see that it's okay. Um, and so actually being able to identify and locate an animal um, using thermal cameras is most effective um, when it is uh, done in real time. You can also record this data, of course, as well for repeated monitoring. 
But I think um, that there is a lot of um, effort now going into artificial intelligence and automating the identification using thermal imagery. But um, there's still some way to go because there really needs to be that library, a validated library of images on which to base the AI. Um, unless you have a really strong library, the, the effectiveness of that is, is limited. And there are a number of projects that um, have already you know, made great leaps and bounds in that area, typically very focused on one or two species um, that are quite large. So an example of where both of these technologies can be combined, um, koalas are, are an obvious one. We've heard um, from a number of speakers this week, but also at the ESA conference last week about koalas and the challenges of, of locating them and surveying them efficiently. Um, thermal work has been shown to be a really efficient way of monitoring populations um, and being able to find them for the tagging, the health checks or even rescue after insane wildfire um, seasons like we experienced last year here. Um, so these are really a really key thing. So they enable you to look at a population more broadly. Um, and you can see on the bottom there, you know, the difference between an RGB image of a koala and a tree were very difficult to see versus a thermal image if you're there um, able to get there in, in good conditions and, uh, and see the koala, it stands out a lot more. With the radio tracking, um, by tagging the animals and GPS tagging them or VHF tagging them, um, you can actually radio track them all simultaneously. And uh, there's a, this map here with the red and the green um, it shows the difference between if you were manually tracking these animals from on the ground, what sort of an area you would be able to cover and from the same locations, what you can cover with the drone. So we're looking at at least triple the size um, of the area that can be surveyed for radio signals. So if animals go missing or um, you really need to go out and, and find an animal to do a health check for ethics purposes, then it's much more efficient to be able to do it with a drone. We can also download the GPS data from these tags because they're close proximity download. So it can also be used um, as a download system. So rather than having to go and actually see the animals, if you don't need to observe them directly, you can actually download the data remotely from a lot further away and not cause any disturbance to those animals at all. The same sorts of things can be done for invasive species. So um, they also can be very difficult to locate um, because they're so wary of people. These are pretty smart animals and they're very successful at keeping away from people. Um, by using a thermal camera and scouting in advance of control parties on the ground, we can assist locating the pests over larger areas so you can be much more targeted. There's no point everyone walking into these inaccessible areas if the animals aren't actually there. You can do reconnaissance with the thermal camera um, before actually spending the time to go and access an area. When you combine that with radio tracking, if you're able to tag some key animals um, of the pest population, you can actually use that to find the animals in real time. So GPS and satellite tags don't provide real time data and the animals move very, very quickly. And so they tend to um, be able to, to move away um, even if you had a location. Um, with the radio tracking, we've actually tested out some feral pig tags and we've been able to de detect them from nine kilometres away. So if you could put a drone up and be able to say, okay, well, actually those pigs are over there, then you can be really targeted in your action. The other nice thing is by combining these two sensors together is that um, for the AI development, which I think is a really key part of advancing the thermal imaging side of this, is to actually get that verified imagery. If you can catch and tag animals and then do some really focused thermal imagery of that within vegetated environments in different contexts and be able to provide that to AI projects, then that is a really powerful thing that they will be able to much more rapidly develop that technology as well. So um, that's just a little taste, I guess, of the different types of applications, the value that they can add. Um, and I'd really love to you know, hear your thoughts and, and experiences and, and um, see what other people might be doing in this space. Thanks very much.